Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Rex. How are you? I am fantastic. And how are you? I'm really well. And thank you so much for making the time to come on the podcast and share your story. It's always great for me to speak to um, colleagues and friends across the pond, as they call it, uh, in the USA. And I've had the pleasure of had so many guests on from the USA. And it's, it's always amazing with this new technology, how we can connect with each other. Uh, when we might never have ever met in person, <laughs> or maybe even ever will, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, it, it is, it's the world got smaller at the same time it's getting larger. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And to be able to connect in this way, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm, I'm truly honored. And, and it's a privilege for me to be here to speak with you to meet mm. you and then to, to have the opportunity to speak where other people who I could maybe never speak to or reach or meet, um, I can speak to and they can listen if they so choose. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to get started with my first open question. It's my only question, really. <laughs> and then the rest of it, I will listen uh, to ask more. So would you tell us a little bit about where were you born? Have you moved around? Um, what about your education, your first job, uh, your career? And then, you know, how you got into what you're doing today and how that all got going. And then we can get in a bit of detail about that great stuff. So awesome. I'm going to hand it over to you, Rex, and I'll just listen. Well, it's a great question. It's a big open question. So, um, you know, today I live a fabulous life. I live the life of my dreams. I own my time. Uh, I do what I want, with whom I want, where I want, and when I want, but it certainly wasn't always like that. And it it began um, ordinarily enough, you know, with, uh, I was born in the Midwest of two parents, both doctors, and um, it had a pretty much normal uh, middle-class upbringing. We were a close family in the sense that we you know, did a lot of family vacations and things together. They supported me in, in, and my sister in everything that we wanted to do. They encouraged us, not because they wanted us to be in the arts necessarily, but they wanted us to have access to it. They forced piano on me, which to this day, I don't play because I didn't like practicing at the time. And I was, you know, ordered to practice. I was raised Catholic. So I was hit on the hands plenty of times with rulers by the, by the, sister who was teaching me and who eventually wrote a note to my parents saying you've now wasted x amount of dollars on this kid's you know lessons and wow. um, yeah so i dabble with the piano but i never i never learned to play it because I, I i did I, I could change that now and go ahead and do it but i have it um, yeah. so so but i was raised uh, catholic uh, by the insistence of my grandmother who had become a converted catholic my parents weren't catholic but so we the children were raised catholic and at, um, at, I'll get back to that in a second, but about, and that yeah. really has nothing to do with anything except the start of my journey. Um, but they put me into dancing lessons and acrobatics when I was about three years old. Right. And, uh, so I did the Nutcracker Suite at three, you know, four. Um, acting class is actually at four years old. And uh, again, not with the idea that I would ever have anything to do with it. At five, I discovered uh, Harry Houdini and uh, wanted to be a magician and, and get into that. And so yeah. they, they encouraged me, they, they got magicians, you know, local magicians to come and give me lessons and, you know, bought me a magic kit and things like that. And so I started yeah. performing. Um, but about the age of six, I, I, when I say we were a close family and they encouraged me, it was great, but I never felt, I didn't feel unloved, but I never felt warmly loved. And it wasn't, it wasn't that they weren't, um, they weren't gregarious in their love, but they are, or, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't, we weren't a touchy feely family, mm. but, they were, but they were a supportive family. And I, and I don't doubt that they loved me, but it wasn't expressed very much. And I grew up, I mean, other than to say, I love you, but they, I, I grew up feeling somehow that even with all these things, and it might've been part of the, the school conditioning that I wasn't worth much, you know, that, that uh, I, 
you know, I was kind of a loser and I felt empty and lonely and didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And the church um, at that time had Latin mass. The priest, you know, had his back to us most of the time. They, they, they converted to English, you know, when I was a child. But uh, I, it, it seemed like this magical place because it was so severely disciplined by the sisters. And then the priests that I knew were welcoming, no, no abuse, nothing like that. But they were very welcoming and, and caring. And the yeah. sisters were horribly, you know, brutal um, in many in many ways and in many instances. But uh, so I, I thought, you know, there's this mystical connection that this priest has with God and there's all this incense and big, you know, and I wanted, I wanted that. I thought that that somehow would help me, that would fulfill me. So I asked my mom if she would start reading me books about it. And, and we had other books like Khalil Gibran and we had the Bhagavad Gita in the house and Napoleon Hill and things like that. So mm. um, Saturday afternoons, we would watch movies, you know, like the comedies and Marx movies so I could be fascinated with movies. And, um, and then on, on evenings, uh, most evenings, she would read to me from one of these books, you know, a page or two or a chapter, depending on what it was. And so I grew up with this interest in kind of otherworldly things, spiritual things, mind things. And um, by the time I was eight, I was, I was practicing, you know, like mind reading and ESP. I'd got the book, uh, uh, Harold Sherman's uh, How to Make ESP Work for You and was trying this stuff with a cousin in, in Texas, you know, and trying to, you know, just trying to figure out how, to, how the mind works. By the time I was 11, I started um, uh, studying hypnosis with uh, my dentist was a hypnotist. And then my, uh, my father introduced me to a stage hypnotist who both gave uh, me lessons and instruction in hypnosis. So I started doing that. And at that time, I started teaching. So I started teaching magic to the kids at like the local YMCA and different places. And I was performing. I, I'd been performing uh, first at school when I was about seven or eight, and then around the, the city and then the state and then around the country. So, um, you know, I had this just this kind of weird childhood in that way. Um, wow. I, quit, I quit acrobatics around 12. I was injured in, in the gym class and tore all the tendons and ligaments out of my, in my knees to my ankles. And so that, that interrupted the gymnastic pursuit. <clears throat> um, one, while I recovered and two, because of the damage done. But um, uh, I've never really had a, a, a full-time job. Uh, my first job was I swept the sidewalk for my grandmother uh, she had a business in the in the town, and so she had a back alley behind her business, and uh, you know a sidewalk that went around. And so I got a, a push broom, and uh, swept the sidewalks. I think I was eleven or twelve when that started. Yeah. I, got, I think I got I might have gotten two dollars or a dollar or something to do this, and um and then I graduated to sweeping the sidewalk and washing the store windows with a squeegee. And uh, I hated it. I just hated it. I was like, this is not for me. This is not who I am. I don't, I, I, and to sweep the side. I mean, I, I, I sound, you know, precocious, but privileged and snobby when I say this, but I was like, I didn't want to be sweeping an alley. I didn't want to be breathing in the dust and stuff like that. I just wanted to perform yeah. and I wanted to master this mystical connection. So I kind of vowed that my career would be one in acting or, or in mystery, uh, the mystery arts, and that I would, uh, and I wasn't going to work a nine to five kind of thing. Wow. So I went through high school and then into college and I hated college and, and then yeah. started doing a professional acting career. Um, and, and so that's how that happened in Los oh. Angeles. Well, the thing is, I mean, if you're exposed at such a young age to, you know, hypnosis, mystical things, mind reading whatever you know esp and and even at such a young age would consider that these things are even possible mm. you know then 100 percent everything else that is the normal kind of sheep dip approach which is you know get an education get a job it's it's going to be foreign to you you're gonna i mean feel like you didn't belong to what other people were doing yeah there was there was some of that I mean you know yeah. that, I mean I didn't feel superior to anybody it wasn't like I I, I you know it, it didn't make me feel better because I was trying to find what the hole was in me I yeah was 
and why I didn't feel I felt that there was I always have felt that there was something bigger there was a purpose you know and, and I know a lot of people feel this way but I didn't know what it was and I, I didn't no. know how to connect with it and so I spent a significant part of my life especially my early life trying to find out what that was and and I now today I look back and go wow how fortunate I was because uh, it could have come about any other way, but I, you know, th there are religions that believe you choose your birth and you choose your life experiences. And I don't know that I believe that or not, but mm. I like, I like it because if that's true, I chose this family, you know, I chose my, yeah. I chose, I chose everything, you know, good, bad, right or wrong. And, and as I said, I don't know that that's true. I'm not, I'm not trying to push that belief on anyone. I'm just saying that as a framework, I go, that's pretty darn cool. You know, and there are mm. other people who think it's all haphazard and there's no connections and there's no synergy and there's, you know, it's all it's all random. And I go, if that's what happened, well, then that's cool too, because somehow I connected yeah. by accident, to, you know, of all the possible accidents, I, I finally intersected at some point. So um, it doesn't, it's not about having a particular uh, belief about this stuff, but I just feel extremely fortunate on the one hand, extremely wise on the other hand to make that choice. You yes. Know? And to have that that opportunity, but even even if our life experiences and our journey here on Earth wasn't predetermined, right. the decisions we make in our life are part of what we create, right? So it's I always remember this phrase. I'm sure it was Robbins who said it. Tony Robbins who said something like, you know. You, in the moment of your decision, you know, your future, you shape your future, basically. I think Jim Rohn actually said it, but there could Jim be Rohn. Uh, Jim Rohn or Tony pop popularized it, sure. Yeah, and probably it, he did. Yeah. Decision, your destiny is created, or, you know, you know the kind of thing, sure. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and you know, some people do believe that, that, the, that everything is predetermined. Other people believe that it's predetermined to the point at which you have choices, that your choices actually, you either go this way or that way. Maybe it's all laid out, but you actually have some choice in the matter of which way you choose. Yeah. Now that people, because of the internet and because of quantum physics and everything, think there are multiple universes or dimensions or, you know, that, that simultaneously existing as, as every possible scenario that could possibly be. I, and I actually, I enjoy, again, I enjoy that. I don't know, I don't say it's true or not true, but I enjoy thinking about it because if everything, it, I do know that energy can't be created or destroyed according to physics and that it can only be transformed. And that's, yeah we live in this kind of closed universe like think about the world for a second we live inside a glass encased bubble i mean a, a yeah. cloud encased bubble you know where we're not really losing much you know that goes out through the atmosphere and not much is coming in i mean it's radiation and things like that but mm. everything that ever existed that was this beginning at the beginning of time is here now you know yeah and so at the beginning of time in our world air travel computers the stuff we're talking about right now existed just not in the form that it existed it mm. took it took human consciousness the you know to develop a, along the line to figure out how to manufacture or um transform raw materials into rubber and plastic and metal and electrical components and yes you know, and and from ideas then these these technology but everything that was needed has always been here you know yes and i love the part you know that we're 70 percent water and you know we're carbon-based things and all the minerals you know for the, are in us and that kind of stuff and and some will say, well, there's even alien. I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to anything. And, you know, and uh, because if it gets us out of our the, the, the benefit of what my upbringing was like was I had a very narrow upbringing in the church that told me I had to go this way. Yes. Uh, not just because every morning we went to church because being in a Catholic school until I was 11, till six, till seventh grade, I started a public school. But it was very narrow in terms of what we did. Mm. And public school was an opportunity to to not have a religious upbringing but now we had the socialization upbringing we were we didn't i don't remember if we had to do pledge allegiance i did pledge allegiance at some point in some schools but i don't know that we did it in in our middle schools but uh, yeah or, right but we we were learning to be good citizens and to learn to be good students and good good you know people not not be free thinkers or be you know creatives or anything like that necessarily but to to learn how to you know get the job do the auto mechanics do the you know home ec do uh 
civics. We had civics at the time, which you know taught us about our government. Um, so I always feel that you know uh, there was this this side that was leaning real heavy toward religious conditioning, and then real heavy, not real heavy, but heavy enough to be socialized, you know, cultural mm. conditioning. And then I had this whole other world, which was like, be a free thinker, think of outside the box, um, try and experience new states of being that meditation. I started meditating around the time I was doing the hypnosis at 11 and wow. I started reading Napoleon Hill. So I've read Napoleon Hill every day, just about every day with the exception of maybe a year and a half in my life and, and other books repeatedly. Um, but, and, and the time that I got into trouble, which I write about in my book, uh, was when I had stopped all of these practices. But when I was doing these, um, sometimes, you know, I was on top of the world and sometimes I was still kind of struggling with these issues of who I am and and why am I here and and what is this about? Because I always yeah. felt, and, and the teaching part of it, that, you know, I share, I teach, I present, I'm an author, I, I do all, and I act and I do all these things, but it's always been, if if there's something that transforms me I share it. I give it. I I want other people to know it. It's like I I know that it's not for me alone, you mm. know. And it's, I'm not alone on this journey. And so if I find a good thing, it's like if I find a great restaurant. I mean, I know you do this too. You know, you find a great restaurant. You go. You got to go try this restaurant. You yes. see, a good movie, you go. Get it, go check this movie. So when it comes to life transforming practices and principles i want to go guess what <laughs> if i can do this you can do this if 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 i can overcome these difficulties then you can overcome these difficulties so if i was lonely and you're lonely hey guess what i discovered uh, yes. so it, it, and and i've always been pulled you know it's, it's i've always had this pull in that area and and i you know i fought it for a long time i kept going i'm not going to go there I'm not going to go there it's not for me just let me act just let me do the you know, the mind reading and the magic, let me, let me do that. I don't want to have anything to do with this. And I just kept getting pulled and pulled and people kept saying, why aren't you out teaching or why, why don't you have a commune or, you know, a community or something. And, and mm. I, and I think, cause I, I, you know, and I don't want to be Tony Robbins. I don't want to be the guy who's the, the big guy on the stage who supposedly has all the answers, you know, where all the attention is. Right. That's, that's not who I am. No. I just want to be somebody that people can approach and come to and I can go check this out this is really cool you know yes. if we sit together and and have a, a lunch that's very cool if we can sit together have a lunch and talk that's even greater if we could sit together and just meditate beautiful you know yeah. and um and in doing that you know I have a, a community I have uh, you know people you know that have reached around the world but it's it's all very simple it's all just very beautiful and it's based on this notion that um from from my upbringing and from my experience a, a phrase that tony has popularized i think again from jim Rohn or somebody else but it's it's really very true is if you always do what you always did you always get what you always got you know if you keep yeah. repeating what you know you only continue with what you know so in order to get outside of that circle you have to think differently and what i love about napoleon hill is thinking grow rich was, you know, he said, it's not think, it's not work hard and grow rich, it's think and grow rich, meaning that the first step in, in accomplishing anything is the thought. That's how, you know, the phone got here, the computer we're talking, and somebody thought about it and probably wrote it up, drew a diagram or something, assembled a team and the resources and money to manufacture it. It worked and then, you know, assembled a team and the, you know, and, and the money and everything to market it and had to convince the public that it was worthwhile and the public got it and then the public convinced other people that, you know i mean in other words it spread but it started with a single thought maybe in the heads of different people and one person yeah. got lucky with, with the idea because you know it's like nobel prize winners sometimes they have five or six nobel prize winners getting the prize and they've all been independently working on the same topic not knowing the other people are doing it yeah so it's, it's really cool I, I agree with you. I, I, I'll share a really quick story. I went to Las Vegas once, quite a few years ago now, to a, I'm sure you know of them, a Hay House publisher, Hay House Conference. And, uh, you know, it was very, it was great. It was personal development. And I was thinking, why did they do it in Las Vegas? You know, it's in a hotel. You've got to walk through the, you know, there's no lobby in hotels. You've got to walk through the casino to get anywhere because they just want your money, you know. 
And I was like resisting it. And I was like getting angry about why, you know, in Las Vegas. And then I went for a stroll during the break, walked around Las Vegas, looked up, saw billboards the size of skyscrapers. And well, they would be the size of houses in this country, in the UK. And I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. And I'm looking around and I'm walking around and this, there are these cities inside the city and Venice and God knows what else. I'm thinking, we're in the desert. Somebody thought about this and started to draw something on a piece of paper and go, this would be cool to put in the desert. It started with one thought and look at it now, this huge city with all this wealth and all this people having a good time because people were having a good time. It's like, you know, the Disney world for adults and yeah, Disney world is still also good for adults, but you know what I mean? Sure. And I, I, yeah. And it was at that precise moment that I went, wow, the power of the mind. It's incredible. Beautiful experience, wonderful story. What a share! And yet, it's so true, you know. And 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 the the beautiful part about that is is everything that we know, that that is part of the human world. I mean, you know, the, the, the world existed before we got here, but the part of the human world, the the stuff that we use, whether it's a spoon or a computer or a city like Vegas, mm. came about as a result of our consciousness, a result of one idea, yes. putting the plan into action, and then carrying out that plan. But it also came about with the belief that they could do it, you know, because if they didn't think it was possible, if they didn't actually attempt it, if they didn't believe that they were going to be successful in some form, they never would have done it. No. You know, like the Wright brothers would have quit instead of. That's continuing. right. You no, know, they, they wouldn't have kept going. They had to believe it. And, and the thing cool that's about the Wright brothers is they didn't know how to fly. I mean, they, nobody would ever flown before. No. And so they they could only experiment. And so they would do something and it wouldn't work. So they would take the feedback, they would make an adjustment, they would try it again and it wouldn't work. And they would make an adjustment, they would try it again and it wouldn't work. And until so one day it worked and then they went, wow, we've done it. Now they could improve it. And as a yeah. result, we're at the outer edges of the universe, you know, with, with, uh, with the technology that came about because people decided, you know, that they could do something that had never been done before. I, I want to share a little story too, which will sound kind of crazy, but it'll mm. it, sample. The converse is true, by the way. The, the crap in people's lives is a result of an idea as well. Yes. And that city of crap, it, you know, that where people's lives are, are, are not the kind of life that they want and they feel bad and they're living and it's all in turmoil and they don't have the money and, and they're in crisis or whatever is part of their thinking too. You know, so yeah. you either have this really wonderful result or you have a really not so good result or you have anything in between. When I was uh, 18, I, one of my first professional movies, prior to that, I, you know, amateur movies, I made movies, I acted and stuff, but, you know, I started doing, and then, and when I was 19, I became a, a Screen Actors Guild member, but at 18, I, I, I started, I lived in a sound studio in Hollywood, I lived in Columbia Studio Sound, it had been abandoned by Columbia, they moved to Burbank, and they left it pretty much to rot, and they were renting out those, the sound stages, and they rented one to a guy who created a living environment in it so he could live there and make movies. And so we, I discovered him and I lived there and made movies, but they rented it out to musicians and another soundstage and a lighting company. And other, so like Billy Joel would come in and Earth, Wind and Fire and Elton John, they would all drive past my front door wow. where the guard gate was. I was right in front of the guard gate with this one-armed guard named Joe O'Flynn or Fling. And uh, so they would have to stop and we'd be standing there going, <sighs> It's, and they go, come on, you know, and we could sometimes go down and watch them rehearse. So they'd come by and wave. And, you know, so it was, I'm, I'm 18, 19 years old. It was really pretty impressive. Yes. By the way, I was at the dog park last summer. And, you know, I've, I've you know, this was uh, like 1974, right? And I've never met another person in the world other than the people who live there with me that mm. would corroborate my story. Right. Now, this is why I think, you know, well, okay, it, it, the universe is either truly random or there's some kind of weird thing going on. Mm. I'm at this dog park and I'm just another guy and I are sitting at this table and we start a conversation 
and somehow it turns to some movie and I said something, he said something, and he said he is a friend in the movie business. And I said, well, I, I was in the movie business, or I am in the movie business. So we started to talk. And one thing led to another, and I said, well, when I was 18, I lived in the soundstage at Columbia, and Billy Joel, he goes, wait, just a minute. He goes, I just heard about this. I go, what are you talking about? He said, I, a couple months back, I was listening to the Howard Stern show, and Howard Stern had Billy Joel on. And said, I understand that you used to rehearse at this motion picture studio. And Billy Joel said, yeah. And so this is the first time in like 40 years or something that I've ever heard an independent uh, corroboration of my story. Wow. Um, and it was this random guy I meet at a dog park. And, we, and we've since become friends. He was a big hotel owner. And, you know, he owns like three or four different hotels. He turned out to be a very wealthy guy. Yeah. But, uh, I was just totally blown away that... Uh, that somebody had heard this and it happened to be on a, on a world global radio program. But um, that's incredible. I was uh, the first movie we, we were shooting um, uh, up in, up in the canyons above Malibu in, in, in um, California. Hmm. So we pulled up onto this property and allegedly it was owned by Clint Eastwood and they had a, a, a guard in, you know, in a trailer and things like that, that, that managed the property. So we got there and, the car's parked. And I thought, I'm going to go for a walk. This is great, right? I'm up in the canyons. I'm walking around. I go and I walk off and I come walking around and everything. And when I come back, maybe 45 minutes later, because I was I was able to take my time, the, the guy who managed the property grabbed me by my throat and pushed me up against the property. He goes, where on earth did you go? And I said, I, I just went for a walk. He said, do, you do know that there are rattlesnakes here. There are coyotes here. There are wild animals here. Wow. He said, and he pulls up this dead rattlesnake. He goes, this is what I killed this morning under my trailer. You do not walk around. You know, and I was like, well, I, I just went for a walk. He goes, yeah, but you don't walk like that. I need to know what you're doing, you know? And I mean, he, was mm. really, he wasn't mad at me as much as he was trying to, I think, put the fear of, you know, yes. of everything into me. I had just done what I always did. I said, well, this is cool. I'll go for a walk. I didn't think about the environment. I didn't think that there might be danger. I didn't think anything. So it goes back to, if you always do what you always did, you know, you could get the results that you get, you know, or, or you just don't think outside. So he, in a, in a almost violent way, I mean, he didn't hurt me, but I mean, in an almost no. violent way, trying to say, wake up, <laughs> you yeah. know, there are, there are things that you need to know and be aware of if you're going to do something like that. And, and it's, yeah. and, um, and guess what? I could have set the example for a bunch of other people. I could say, Hey, come and walk with me. And, you know, who knows? so, um, mm. you know, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. So the Wright brothers thought outside the box and got air travel. Other people yeah. do what they always do and don't think outside the box and, and have a crappy marriage or a crappy life where they go financially bust or whatever. So this is why Hill said the first step in changing is to change your thinking. And yeah. once you change your thinking, then everything else can change. And, and one idea can change the world. The phone, you know, the computer, yeah. the city of Vegas. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and and it was started by criminals <laughs> so yes <laughs> and i was watching i'm kind of halfway through watching the netflix documentary on spacex and you know the first rocket from u.s soil going to the space station and part of the story that they're telling is these reusable rockets now where the rocket you know takes off and then part of the rocket comes down and lands back on earth again, which is like a 10th of the cost that they would have had previously when the rocket was never. And again, they showed clips of rockets crashing when they were trying to land, burning, exploding, you know, at least 10, 15 of them. But in the end, they got them, they got it working and they learned from the mistakes of all the others that went before. The only thing we will never do, and you can quote me on this, is what we don't think we can do. If we decide something is impossible, it will always remain impossible. The, yeah. the great pioneers of science and medicine and philosophy and, you know, of, of the world have always at some point went, I've got to at least try it, you know, and if it proves mm. me wrong, I'm wrong. And then, and then maybe they died in the pursuit of it. You know, they didn't live to see it like the pyramids, you know, got built over centuries, you know, but somebody else mm. picked up the ball and 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 try it you know we, look at where the wright brothers ended and look at where we are today yeah you know? uh, the idea of ditching rockets in the ocean 
or all the space junk we've got floating around in space now as a result of our efforts mm. that didn't exist there that we could recycle or could have recycled had we thought about it at the time. Yes. I mean, they were willing to blast humans up into space, not even knowing if they'd ever come back. <laughs> you know? mm. um, mm. I'm not so, and they did that with some monkeys, I believe, but you know, or dogs, but I don't, yeah. um, sad, but, um, you know, I don't know that you need to ever sacrifice life in order to, you know, I mean, in that regard, in order to, no. to, <clears throat> to have innovation, but, but because they were trying, we are where we're at now, what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I lived in I lived in a community in, in in here in this country that had was the first community to have a recycling program, wow. and everybody thought it was crazy. And we had mm. we were, we had the first debit card in the United States. They had them in Europe, but we didn't have them here. And people no. were like, "What is that?" And they yeah. go, "Well, we put money into a bank account and then we can extract it. It's kind of like a check, but you get cash. You go and get your cash." And they were like, "Well, that's like socialism or communism. That's like really, I mean, now we you know, it's everything. But at the time." Yeah. They, this was yeah. the early 80s. People were wow. like, that, that's, what is that? You know? Yes. So you've got your money and, and you don't have it. You know, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> the bank has my money and I don't have it. It's the same thing. I just, I, you know. So Rex, you, you, you said very nicely that, you know, you, you learn something, you want to spread it and share yeah. it with other people over lunch or in a chat or with a group of people. How, and then you had an acting career. So, so let me first ask the first question. How long was your acting career for? Well, it's still going on. I have a movie coming out in, in June called Shooting Star. It's a Western. Um, this Thursday on my show, All Things Rex, I'm, I'm actually interviewing the three, oh, that's tomorrow, um, I'm at, which would be 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So right. wherever that is around the world. Um, it's the producer, Peter Shireko. And Peter is an actor, producer, a Western historian, an author. Uh, he's a good friend. He, he uh, called me up one day and said, yeah, you want to part in this movie? Can you do this? I said, yeah, I can do that. And all actors say they can do it even if they can't, but I, I could. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so he, yeah, I, I flew back to Los Angeles and did the movie. This was at the right before the end of 2019, we did the movie. And, and so the last time I was in L.A. was the beginning of, you know, maybe February between that time in February of 2020. And then I came home to yes. the Midwest, my other home. And, uh, and then COVID broke. So I haven't been back to LA since. And the movie is going to come out, I believe on Father's Day, you know, the June 5th or whatever. Great. I don't know how, I have no idea how. I mean, I don't know if yeah. it's streaming or on Netflix or- Right, season. right. Uh, I, and I don't know if Peter knows tomorrow because I talked to him last week and he said, uh, we're still working on all the, uh, how it's coming out, but- um, yeah. And what, what, what role are you playing? I play, what, who, who, I forget, I can't even think of his name. I play, a, it, it's, a, it's a cute movie. I haven't seen it yet, but it, the, the premise was um, a father has two daughters and uh, one of the daughters is injured in a, they, like, they both ride competitively. They ride horses and, and, and stuff. And one of them is injured and needs an operation. This is in the West, in the Old West. And it's going to cost a lot of money. And so they don't know what to do. Well, the, the, the mayor who is played by Peter, I, I can tell you this is a corrupt mayor and the sheriff who's played by an actor, Michael Pare, who is Streets of Fire and um, uh, um, Eddie and the Cruisers and different movies. Um, both great guys, by the way. And, and a whole, a wonderful cast. I mean, I, everybody that I met and worked with, I just absolutely love and adore and have become friends and have maintained contact with all of them. Yeah, uh, the director's name is Michael Pfeiffer. He's done a ton of movies and ton of TV movies, um, all good people. And uh, it was one of the best, best experiences up on a movie set that I've ever had. It was just a, a, right. a, a wonderful family out, you know, shooting this Western. Anyway, I play a town activist. The, the little girl is injured. The sister, the, the father of the girl, they enter her in a horse riding shooting competition that the mayor is sponsoring in order to kind of uh, steal money from people by having yes. them sign up for this competition. But the little girl enters it. And I'm an activist who I have, I get my men uh, aligned against the sheriff and against the, the, uh, the mayor and, 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 and someone's killed. And I won't say who that kind of thing. I'm not, well, I shouldn't have said that, but I'm not, but <laughs> uh, someone is killed and, and there's some problems and, you know, and, and does it live happily ever after or not? That's, that's, I guess you have to see the movie. 
Absolutely, uh, yeah. But uh, great. But so yeah, it was it was fun, and uh, and Peter is probably best known for one of his roles in the movie Tombstone with Kurt Russell, and, and yes, he, and he's he played Texas Jack, and he uh, so if you see the movie again, you'll you'll recognize him. He mm. produced a movie recently. I forget the name of it. Something. Oh, Bone, it was something Bones. With Kurt Russell's become a good friend of his, and so they produced a movie together in the last few years. So, um, Yeah, so you're still acting? So and I still act. I teach acting. I, I was teaching filmmaking at the university here a few years back. Uh, mostly how to navigate a career business in the film business and how, you know, and how to uh, network and, 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 and create the kind of um, friendships that you need in order to get ahead in the film business, not so much the yeah. nuts and bolts. I yeah. produce, I do some directing, you know, but primarily I always just wanted to act. And uh, and I've taught acting. I started teaching acting in the 70s with a, an acting coach of mine Yeah. And, uh, for on camera. Hmm. And, you know, I taught magic. And, 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 and after what I write about in my book is when kind of my life fell apart. And how I pulled it back together, I started sharing what I knew in 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 weekend seminars originally, where we would meditate, we would use hypnosis, we would use affirmations and everything. And then it expanded to the business community and the NLP communities and things like yes. that. And and so it's grown. I mean, so for uh, I've been doing this about fifty five years of my life, and uh, professionally, I guess you could argue I've been doing it about forty two years of my life. Yes, and it's always been with the idea that if I've got something cool, I want to give it back to people, um, you know. And so, and so I do that, and and I've and I've been able to to live and do that, and and to enjoy that, and and to do it on my terms. Mm. Um, so had, you mentioned, you know, when things went a bit wrong in your life, mm -hmm. what what are you able to share? What happened? Sure. Well, yeah. I, I was in my twenties and I, and I was frustrated with my career at the time. I didn't realize, I didn't know what to do. I wanted a mentor. I wanted a coach. I wanted somebody who would take me under my wing at that mm. time, the prevailing attitude for most acting classes, with the exception of the one that I taught with this woman, Lillian Chauvin taught me so much about living and what later would become neuro-linguistic programming. And nobody knew the term at the time, No, but she just had this kind of natural, insight into it her background had been in psychology she was born in france during the you know the world war ii she was a war child and um, came to this country in the 50s to pursue a, an acting career and, and was acting and and teaching acting and mm -hmm. lovely woman um i was very the, the failing thing was you had to be the best like you needed to be academy award caliber acting you were always you know and if you weren't the best actor uh then you were nothing and which is not I, I get I get the angle on it because they want people to be authentic on film because a, a, a camera captures you, you know, it's a different thing than theater. But <clears throat> what they didn't teach at the time, which now is is kind of all over the place, is <clears throat> how do you connect? How do you how do you navigate a business? How do you how do you how do you impress the people you need to impress? What do you need to do? It's not about acting. I mean, yes, you should be a good actor, but sometimes you go into an audition and you make the wrong choices for the character. Yes. Yeah. But they see something in you and you may not get the part that time, but they might like you and want to bring you back. Yes. I at the time looked at it like if I didn't get it, I was a loser. It came from my right. child. I was going, they don't, they're rejecting me. They don't like me. Um, this is hard. You know, yes. I'm either too tall or too small or too big or too fat or too good looking or too bad looking or too goofy or too what, or I got parts that I didn't think that I should be playing and I didn't get the parts I did think. I was really getting very, very frustrated and really angry. Yeah. And discouraged. <clears throat> but I was like, I'm in it for the long haul, but I just was, I was, I was mad at the business. Mm. And I, I did another movie called Pale Horse, Pale Rider. I played Death on Horseback. And they gave me for six months, seven months, they gave me um, horseback riding lessons so that I could stunt ride. I didn't have to fall off a horse, but I had to be able to rear it up and I had to be able to gallop at full speed and stop on a dime and all this good stuff. Um, with the premier horse training, horse wranglers in, in Hollywood. I mean, I, I talk about being lucky, right? I get, I get, yeah. I love riding. So, um, so this was, this was awesome. And 
the movie starred Charlene Tilton, who was famous from Dallas, and we had been yes. friends. We'd actually, I had another job. I worked for a couple months at a movie theater, the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood Boulevard, and, and Charlene worked there, and we became friends. Mm. And she went, went across the street to the Hollywood t-shirt store or whatever, and, and I got fired for helping some lady find her seat because the, the manager said he wouldn't let her do that, and I said, come on, I'll help you, and so he fired me. Oh. And, um, you don't go against me, you know. And um, and so uh, Charlene and I would see each other around and be friendly, but then suddenly we're cast in this movie together. And um, she's uh, a woman who has these dreams in the in the story and I'm death visiting her on horseback. So they they would let me ride, but they wouldn't let Charlene ride. Her, her contract with Dallas wouldn't let her do her stunt riding. So they had to get her stunt riders. And in order to get doubles that could ride, uh, was a tough thing they went through three of them and the one they finally landed on because these horses are so well trained <clears throat> they know they have so many commands if you lay the reins a little bit this way or that way or this way or that way or that way or you lay it this way and you shift that way or this way the horses all of these are different signals for the horse to wow be you have to be able to sit on the horse and control the horse and not teach to get to do other things so it has to know that you know what you're doing Yes, of course. Which I use as an analogy for your subconscious mind, by the way. If you know how to ride the horse, then the horse will take you where you want to go. If you train your subconscious mind, you know what to do. Your subconscious mind will take you wherever you want to go. But if you don't know how to train it, if you don't condition it, if you haven't, if you don't instruct it, then it'll do whatever it wants to do, which is what these horses would do or what you ride. Know. Or these, these girls are not getting anywhere. So they finally got one who could ride and, and learn it. And she asked me if I'd go skydiving. So I told my girlfriend at the time, I'm going to go skydiving. And it also happened to be with a woman. And she was, this was not good. This was not good. No. So I go skydiving with this girl anyway, because I wanted to skydive. And I got injured. I hit too hard. I didn't break anything, but it, it really wrenched, broke up my, it didn't break my back, but I, I no. injured my back. And um, it wasn't a crash landing. It was it was a, 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 a regular landing, but it was uh when your eye, when you're about eyes even with the horizon, you're about 200 feet. You've got less than a second to hit the ground. And I was so busy trying to hit the target. Ah, uh, okay. I, up, I went, and you, you didn't started. get yourself ready. No. So I landed stri stiff legged instead of loose. Right. So when I landed, I went boom and yes. fell over. And I was like, so I ended up going to a doctor. I read about this is what I write about in my book. And I went and I asked, you know, I said, I, I haven't been able, I, and I tried to hide it from the girlfriend. I'm like, I can't sleep and I'm really injured. And she was mad at me for the whole thing. So I, um, I went to this doctor and he gave me a, a prescription that turned out to be literally, I mean, actually a fatal combination of pills that should have killed <gasps> just by taking them. Oh my God. And, and it didn't. And then I've been considered a medical miracle, but um, it, it I, and I took them repeatedly and, and nobody understood not that at that time, um, they were like, I, we don't know how you survived this, but it, I, I took, I took them in the office. It was a office in Beverly Hills. I said, I got to go pick up my sister in Hollywood. Can I take these now? And he went, yeah. And he gave me the little paper cups with the pills in it. And, you know, and, um, I drank them. My sister said, you're a completely different person. You know, you, I don't know how I knew to get there or what she said, you were all over the road. You know, whenever the drugs kicked in, she was like, you just became somebody else. You were just, wow. and I, but somehow I knew to take the drugs. I, you know, yeah. I, I don't even know how to answer that one, you know? So I took the drugs and, and I started losing my friends. The girlfriend was like, what the heck is going on with you? I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? It made me angry, but fortunately I didn't hurt. It made me even angrier because I was like, what the heck is going on with me? I don't have a yeah. clue. And now it was like, mentally, I felt like I was falling apart and I didn't, I didn't never traced it to the drugs. I don't know that I ever would have. No. And, um, and uh, so she breaks up with me. I lose all of my friends. Apparently I had gone on auditions, you know, and they were like, get the heck out of here. You're this drunk guy. And I'm like, I, I don't know what I did. I, I didn't even know yes. I was going on auditions until after the fact I had gotten a postcard, which is a rare thing, but I got a postcard. They said, thanks for coming in to see us about this. And I'm like asking my sister who lived in the apartment below me, I said, what was this about? She said, you were going on auditions. I'm like, oh, oh wow. I didn't know. So what happened was I, I kept, you know, I, I was doing that and people would say, well, here, here's a drug, here's a Valium, here's a Quaalude, here's something else, here's a Darvine, here, take these, this will calm you down, you know, for whatever's going on. Here, take my medicines. 
So I, I was a, a walking pharmacy and uh, my sister called my parents who were traveling and said, you know, you need to get out of here. Something's going on with Rex. We, I don't know what happened to him. And so they came out and they found me nearly comatose. I mean, I was out of it. Uh, there were pill bottles around me. There were actually alcohol bottles around me. I had journaled. I had scribbled volumes of journals, not a single legible word. Wow. Just scribbles, just scribbles. So obviously I had a lot to say, but I didn't know how to, to write it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they they took all the medicines, everything away and locked me in my apartment where I went cold turkey. You know, I was just like, I don't know how we ever got the phrase cold turkey. I thought about this the other day. <laughs> what is it about cold turkey that, that has to do with withdrawal? But um, I, uh, I went through I went through withdrawal in the apartment and, and I was really uh, devastated. I was like, tried to reach my girlfriend. She wouldn't have anything to do with me. I uh, called my acting coach, the woman I was talking about. She's like, well, I knew something was wrong with you because you were just really, you know, you kept calling or you kept showing up or, you know, I, 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 I left my wallet there one time and, and they said, well, we gave it to her. And then I call back and go, I need my wallet. They go, well, we gave it to her. And I call back and say, yeah, I can't find my wallet. You know where my wallet is? They go, yeah, we gave it to her. I call back again. I mean, it was this weird kind of stuff. And um, yeah, but she said, we thought you were on drugs. I said, I was, but I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't yes. trying to be on drugs. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know what happened to me. Um, so, so I then tried to kill myself. It's, again, it's in the book. I jump out of a window. <laughs> I go two stories down. I hit grass, fortunately, not cement. I land flat on my head and fall over almost the same way I landed with a with a parachute, but the you know yeah. that way I landed by my feet. And uh, and and my only thought was. I'll say crap, but it was the other word. I and I was like, I couldn't believe I didn't, I didn't, I I was alive. I was like, I can't even kill myself. What the heck is going on? And I got back yeah. up and I ran around. I ran up to my apartment and I had locked myself out. And my family was downstairs in my sister's apartment. They came out, you know, prevented me from getting into the apartment because I was going to break down the door. So they're trying to decide, you know, what psychiatric institute should we you know, institution, should we put yeah, this? Yeah, of course. Yeah. They removed the distributor cap from my car so I couldn't drive at the time. And they, they pretty much locked me in, kind of kept the watch outside. Um, I realized I wasn't going to be able to kill myself jumping out the window, apparently. So I, I didn't do that again. But I literally broke down. I mean, I literally, I just, I mean, I, there was a time where I just wept and wept. Well, I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't tell what had happened. And, um, I just knew I needed to do something. So I, I, I did two things. I started to, to, to seek therapists, you know, so, and they would recommend me to a psychiatrist who wanted to put me on drugs. I'm going, wait a second, you don't understand. The mm. issue was, was prescription medicine. I don't want drugs. And I go, well, you have to have these. You have to have, you know, you're depressed or you're this, you do that. You no. need these food elevators. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I am not going to do that. I'll do some group therapy or some one-on-one -on -one counseling, but mm. I'm not drugs. And I was so, I mean, I'd see, you know, best drugs and drug stores and this, and it just really, I mean, I was like, God, the whole world is just drugs now. Yes. I had never been sensitized to that before. I never noticed it. Mm. I never realized that people had these kinds of problems until yeah. I, my dad, mom were like, you should sue that doctor. And they, they don't believe in lawsuits at all. Right. And they're like, you should sue them. I mean, look what happened to you. Mm. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't even want to go there anymore. I started to drink then. And then abuse drugs all over again. It was really funny. I'm going through therapy and the therapy's not working. I'm feeling horribly guilty. I don't know what to do. So I started drinking and I started, you know, taking some of the other pills again. And, um, mm. and I'm doing this and, and trying to forget what happened and trying to wreck, trying to get the girl back, trying to get my career back, trying to get my friends back. Nobody have anything to do with me. Mm. I drive myself almost over a cliff one night. I'm, I, I, you know, and I'm, I pass out in different places around town and out in the woods and or out in the street, you know, kind of thing. I, I end up um, pushing a mobster, a mafia guy around inside a club. And the next night he, he pretty much threatens to kill me. And I, uh, I, I didn't know who he was. I didn't even know I did this. And um, so what happened was I, um, because I didn't know what was going on. And the, and the, 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 the uh, host of this private club that we were at said, look, you're a good guy. And Rex is a guy. I'm sure he didn't mean anything. Can you shake hands? And the guy's like, well, you're pushing me and my girlfriend around last night. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. I probably was drunk. I mean, I, you know, I, I could say that I was drunk. I, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I went downstairs to talk to a waiter friend of mine, again, in the book. And I said, who is this guy? He said, oh, he just turned about as white as he could get. He goes, why? And I said, well, because he said, I'm pushing him around. He was pretty angry. He goes, you're going to die. He said, you know, you put your car off a cliff. You're found all over the town and the streets, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and now you, you do this, you are going to die. And that was the first time that even though I had wanted to die, I went, yes, I don't want to die. No, I, I don't want to die. What I'm trying to do is live. And I don't know how. Yeah, I'm trying to get together. And I can't figure it out. Yeah. And it, and it, it, it freaked me out. I drove home. And I thought about it. And I ended up locking myself in my apartment for six weeks or more. Mm. And I vowed to not leave my apartment. Again, I went cold turkey on everything. I vowed not to leave my apartment until I could face the world confidently and, and win my friends back. And I wanted to win the girlfriend back at the time, but I, mm. but that, I had a goal to work on, you know, and I wanted to, I wanted to do these things. And um, I wasn't, um, so, so I sat in a chair, I sat in a chair, sorry, I've, I've got a good morning. I've got to just, um, there we go. I, um, I locked myself in the apartment and decided I, I wouldn't come out. I would sit in my, in my easy boy recliner chair. Um, well, that ought to be an ad for them, actually. Um, I sat in this recliner chair for six, six, seven, eight weeks, whatever it was, <coughs> and essentially meditated. I went back to my practice. This is where that about year and a half where I wasn't reading Napoleon Hill every day. I wasn't meditating, wasn't doing right. my practice. You know, I was getting frustrated and angry. I abandoned everything that I knew was right and good. Mm. And so I said, I'm not going to do it. So I went back in the chair. I started to visualize. I started to affirm. I started to hypnotize. I started to do all this stuff. I started reading book after book again, you know, and uh, I did get up to go to the bathroom. I went out to buy food, which was shop down the street, you know, and come back home and I would eat in an apartment and then go back to my chair and sit there. And I would sit there 11, 12, 17 hours a day in this chair, then lie down, go to bed, get up in the morning and do the same thing all over again. Mm. <laughs> and I discovered something during the process that after about half of the time in the chair, when I was there, I was doing things like going, why did this have to happen to me? Why does she not love me anymore? Why, how did I screw this up? Why am I such a loser? How come nobody's going to hire me? I mean, I, all of my questions were all these negative questions about why, what I had done was wrong, how I was wrong, how I was a loser, how the world was a loser, how nobody got me. And I was, I kept doing this for a long time. And how long is this going to take me? And what do I have to do? And why, why does nothing work? And all that. And as there, it, there was a light that went off, almost as if somebody reached down and pulled me out of the water and said, "You don't want to know that stuff. You want to know what you can do to be better." I mean, I was like, "I don't, I don't want to know why I, what, why I did what I did. I want to know what can I do now." Mm. Yeah, that would move me in the direction I, I didn't know that I use these same words, but I do know I, what do I do now? What can I do now? What do I need to know? What do I need to do in order to make my life work? What, what, yes. what I, I discover? What do I have to find to feel confident? Where in me is this confidence or where do I find mm. it in the world? How do I begin to feel love toward myself? Where, yes. How do I love myself? What, what's lovable about me as opposed to going, what's so wrong about me? I'm like, what's good about me? What I need to find what's good about me. What am I good yeah. at? What, if, you know, am I a good actor? If I say no, you know, what if I said, yeah, what, how good of an actor am I? You know, um, how, how can I find love in my life? Why, why, I, why, I, I don't want to know why it didn't work. I want to go, why am I, why am I, going to be able to do this how soon can i get out of here as opposed to how long will it take me yeah so i started to aim my mind i realized that questions kind of i mean i came to this conclusion later but questions carve up the world you know mm. it's kind of like this side and that side so it's like if i said to you where did you get your shirt your mm. brain knows where you got it you may say i don't remember but you might say well i got it as a gift or i went to the store or i got it on this thing or whatever yeah if I say, what is the what, who's the who's the you know, prime minister of your country or the, you know, you, you give me an answer and your brain doesn't have to go any further if you know the answer. Yes. If you go, oh my God. Um, it's, oh, what's his name? It, yeah. It's called tip of the tongue phenomenon. It means, you know, you know it. You yeah. just can't retrieve it at this moment. So you're going, what the, 
all right, forget it. It'll come to me. You know, you give it up in an hour later, a day later, a week later, you go, oh, it's so-and-so. Yeah. And the brain keeps working at it after you give up. Hmm. So if you ask a question you don't know the answer to, but it's a question that leads you in the right way. Because if I yeah. say, why am I such a loser? Your brain will go, well, because when you were four years old, you did this and because your parents didn't love you and you don't have any money and your mm. girlfriend doesn't like you and you, it comes up with all these reasons why. And, and guess what? When you get all these thinking reasons and thinking thoughts that are negative, you don't feel very good. And your brain is squirting the chemicals and the hormones and the, you know, the stuff that make you feel bad or anxious or depressed. Yeah. But if you start asking good questions, like how come I'm so beautiful or how, where, and how many different ways am I resourceful? What kinds of things can I do? So in 1980, I named this directed questions when I came out and I wanted to teach this to people. I, I called it directed questions because they direct your mind. So if I say, where'd you get your shirt? Your mind, your brain goes to how you got it. That's what it goes to look. It doesn't say I like baseball. It doesn't go, yeah. I was abducted by aliens or I drink milk. It goes after the information that you send it on. Yes. And, this, and this is the thing that, and people have, have piggybacked on my work, They've about five or six books. I just read one the other day that calls it something else, but, uh, but it all started with directed questions back in around 1980. And that is that you send your mind on a search by asking a question. If I said, you know, what's the capital of California? <coughs> like I said, your prime minister, you know, the answer, it stops. It doesn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. So you're not asking a yes or no question. You're not asking a closed question. You're asking a question it doesn't know, like, how much fun can I have today? Well, geez, I don't know. No. But I can I can find out, right? Yeah. So I have told everybody in all of my workshops, if you get up in the morning and you look for smiles, yes, you're bound to find a frown or two, you know, because people ask you, well, you know, there's people who frown. Yeah, you're bound to find one or two. But if you focus on finding smiles, that's what your brain is paying attention to. It's what it's looking for. That's what you're going to find. Yes. Kind of like when you're looking for your keys, you might find other things. But you know you're looking for your keys. You know? Yes. <laughs> you know yes. You're, you're not going. Oh, I'm looking for a fork or a, or a car or boots. You know, you're looking for your keys. So when you send your mind in a in a direction, your brain goes, Oh, okay, I got it. And yeah. And if you steer it positively, you're going to get positive results. If you steer it negatively, you're going to pick up all the negative stuff. So if if I say I don't, you know. It's directed questions. Some of it's in my book. A lot of it's in my programs. It's been on yes. my audience programs, like the Ultimate NLP Home Study Course. It's been in there for as long as that program's been out. It's in my Mind Design program. You know, it's in all of my programs essentially. And I, I am coming out with a new book on it since everybody seems to write about it, but they keep missing the 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 important parts. Yeah. Uh, you know, they 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 get around to it, and it can be effective. I mean, just asking a better question could be effective, mm. but. Uh, but there's, but there's, but there's more. Actually, there's more science to it than than just asking the question like, why am I lucky, you know, or why am I great? But and and this was born out of the depths of your despair. God, God yes, yes. And so, I hate to say it. I say this to a lot of people, but because I I I don't like to see or hear about people suffering. Because it's horrible when you're there, oh, but God, when yeah. you're out of it, and something like this has come from it, it's a gift, right? It taught me something really, really, really important, and I and I and it, it totally transformed my life. I, I I woke up to so many things, and mm. and about a year or two later, I really truly woke up to so many things uh, about this and everything else, but. hardship is a gift to us people mm. who oppose us are gifts to us all the attempts that the Wright brothers fail at are gifts to us yes. we don't tend to think that way because we're conditioned not to you know we're, we mm. are conditioned to think work hard you know make money retire you know the, the, whatever society wants but we're not conditioned to think you know adversity is a gift prior to humans being on the planet Lots of things happened. There were plate shifts, there were earthquakes, there were fires, there were lightning strikes, a meteors hit the earth, you know, dinosaurs disappeared. Mm -hmm. And there was no human to call it a good or bad day or a good or bad event. No. We can label things. And, and if you look at the, you know, some people don't believe we evolved, but if you look at the evolution of civilization, let's put it that way, from independent <clears throat> people that, however they showed up, 
moving around to assembling tiny bands and then tribes and then clan, you know, and larger into into societies where they ended up with some form of political structure, meaning there's a leader in the thing. And mm. I mean, and the way that happened is there were, you know, this leader and that leader married their kids or gave cows or animals or livestock so they could unite so that they, as they would be a bigger force to oppose those leaders over there who were all going after the same resources. So, you know, we, we became these collectives of things. Yes. And as we did, so I now have my spear or my bow and arrow or my knife or my spoon or my, you know, whatever, my carved out bowl. I now start to have possessions and I have a hut or a lean to or whatever. If the wind comes down and blows my hut down, I can go, crap, this is a bad day. Now my house is destroyed. If a fire yes. comes, now my possessions are gone or people I love or the animals, my livestock is gone. I call it a bad day. <clears throat> yeah. But you know what? If the plants don't get weather uh, obstacles like storm and high winds, they don't grow up very strong. No. A plant grows stronger if there's like a, if there's a little bit of a drop, not enough to kill it, but you know what I'm saying? Because yes. it, has to, it has to thrive during the times where it's deprived. Mm. And that's what hardship teaches us. We can thrive through hardship. If you celebrate, and my tagline is celebrate everything. If you perceive it as a problem, it will be a problem. If yes. you perceive it as a blessing, it can be a blessing. Yeah. I look back and, and Steve Jobs is the one who notably said it. You can look back and connect the dots, but you can't connect them forward. So yeah. I can look back and go, <clears throat> because of that incident, I had this incident, this incident, this incident, this incident. I can make a roadmap. Maybe mm -hmm. it would have been any other way, but it wasn't. So I can look back down that and go, it started with me sitting in a chair. And that started with me taking drugs in an office. And that started with me getting a job yes. in Hollywood. And that started with being born. You know, And that yeah. started with Big Bang Theory. So, you know, I go, this is an amazingly incredible, immense, complex, mysterious, but also in many ways, benevolent universe. Mm. And it's both, there's both good and bad, because, you know, if you if you study physics or science, um, the law of polar opposites or the law of cause and effect says if there's something good happens, <clears throat> well, if something happens, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. Your batteries have a negative and positive pole on it. That's not like a negative experience and a positive experience. It's just... No different the different way we divide energy so if we stop calling things good or bad <clears throat> and you know and labeling in that regard and taking the judgment out of it and the label out of it <clears throat> and just say you know it's a situation where i'm learning to explore some opportunities that i didn't have before yes as opposed to this is the worst thing that ever happened to me and i don't know how i'm going to make my rent on, on sunday mm -hmm. <clears throat> i get the opportunity to try and figure that out and if i figure that out successfully or not successfully whatever happens is an opportunity for something else and yeah. then almost all if you look at all the 520 people that napoleon hill studied or modeled for thinking growish almost all of them had massive hardship massive financial failure mm. um, prior to being successful <clears throat> and then yes. many of them had that after being successful and many of them because they then made money the only thing important to them and that family and love and life and, and peace and you know calm and all that. Some yeah. of them were crazy, some of them committed suicide, some of them ended up in jail. You know, yeah. some of them, you know, in, in, in one of Hill's last books before he died, he said only John Burroughs, the naturalist, really out of the 520 had a great life because he sought peace. You know, he liked nature. Money came to him because of what he loved and what he how he organized his life. But it wasn't it wasn't the pursuit of money. It was the pursuit of something bigger than money. Yes. So, you know, I'm all for money. I don't have a problem with money. I don't. I, and there are uber uber rich, and I don't begrudge them their riches. I I I wish they'd share it with the world and yes. instead of buying up media platforms, they feed the homeless and hungry and you know things like that. Mm. But mm. I can't mm. tell them how to spend their money. But um, maybe someday. But I can't tell them. How yeah. to, I can't tell them how to spend their money. Um, but it's, 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 it's a, just a means of, of transaction in order to do good in the world, really. And, and to be able to, because that's where we're at now, it's, it's not yeah. like it's going to go away, you know, unless we go back to zero and we start trading beads again, and, you know, and shiny rocks. I thank you so much for sharing, you know, first all the suffering that you went through, but also beautifully what came out of it and how you've been able to transform that and share that with other people through your programs and your writings. Um, if, if people wanted to, to check you out and get hold of some of that stuff and get your book and audio programs, where, where can they go, Rex? 
Well, cool. I, I'll show you the book. It's right here. I don't know if you can see it. If you can see it. Yes. I find Life on your terms. The reason why I show that is because there, somebody else has a book by the same title, apparently. It's not the same title, but, you know, one of similar title. So it's that's the book. You can get it on Amazon. <clears throat> you can go to my website, which is Rex Sykes, my name. Uh, it might even show up on your screen somewhere. Or, it, it does. Hmm. Not for the audio listeners. So, but it's yeah, Rex I can see I know, that's a good point. Yeah. So the audio listeners who couldn't see my book, it's a yellow book. It's life on your terms. It's got a photo of me on the cover. But it's Rex Sykes, R E X S I K E S, S S is in Sam, I K E S. Dot com, RexSykes.com. You do a search for me, I'll come up in a lot of different ways. But RexSykes.com forward slash book, B-O-O-K. And that will take you to my website. It will take you to, because I have a gift for your listeners and your viewers. And that right. is buy the book from Amazon. No, no, it's, it's, I, I love being able to do this. <clears throat> and I want to address two things before, before we sign off. But um, if they go to the website, it will, it will, it will, tell them that if, when they go to Amazon and they buy the hardcover, softcover book to bring their receipt code back and put it in a special place right, right. there on the website, you know, they'll follow instructions. They will get a $497 bonus training for me as a gift, absolutely free, called the Mastery Loop, which is about how we master things, how we go from unconscious incompetence to conscious, unconscious competence, rather, how we master our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors. It's everything that I've learned. I have spent, you know, you've just heard some of my story, but I have spent 55 years or more, um, you know, exploring, learning, studying, um, mm. get coaching and mentors. <clears throat> I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in workshops and seminars, you know, trying to learn to, and, and, and then to also share it and give it away. And, and, uh, and so I do in, in a variety of, you know, of platforms. I have courses there. The Ultimate NLP Home Study Program is one. It's ongoing right now. People can sign up today if they wanted to jump in. There's a class. Our next live Zoom is coming up. They could jump in. We, we, if they sign up, you know, right now, we'll put them in the same support study group as the people who are there who are fabulous people. Otherwise, they'd end up in a different group and be fine. But I'm just saying that there's a, yeah. a, one support group that we're doing right now that's really good. Um, the mind design is, is, is what I've learned about yes. how to have fun and enjoy and, and love life and create the kind of life that you do deserve. So the, the, the training, the mastery loop is, is a, a bonus training. It's an online training that you can get as an introduction to how we learn and how we change and how we can master, like I said, our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, and our talents and abilities. And, um, and that's my gift for getting the book from Amazon. Thank that's you. That. That's a fantastic gift. And one I'm definitely going to check out and I'm sure the listeners and viewers will. Um, thank you so much. What a great offer and great idea as well. I mean, for me, um, you wanted to share something else, did you? Um, yeah, as yeah, well? I wanted yeah. A couple of things. Well, and I just did a Les Brown, uh, you know, so many, so many cool people have said so many great things. Les Brown is the number one, you know, speaker in the world. I uh, just yes. interviewed me um, a few days back last week about my book. He's like, he called me up one day and goes, Rex, I love your book. It's, it's changing so many people's lives. I, you know, and I refer it. And so he, right. he interviewed me last week. Mark Victor Hansen wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. Yes. Uh, Brian Tracy. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of people who are, you know, uh, Joe Vitale from The Secret yes. you know, is uh, so many wonderful people. And, but not just celebrities and, and well-known people, but, but, but people, you know, all over the world are, are sending me mm. photos of themselves with the book and, and quotes and they're rating and reviewing it at Amazon. So it's really pleasing. And, uh, and as well, I wanted to say, going back to the hardship and, and you said it came from struggle. I, again, I don't want to step on any religious toes or anything, but I look at Jesus in the last days of his life and I'm, I'm mm. not making comparison to Jesus, but I'm comparing to the, to the story. Yes. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, you know, take this from me. I don't want to do this. This is this is too big. But not my will, but your will. And he and he acquiesces. He he gives in. He he says, okay, it isn't my will, it's your will. I'll go with the flow. As a result, he goes before Pilate. He's silent when he's asked to defend himself. He makes no excuses, no blames, no whatever. They say, Are you God? He goes, Well, that's what you say. I didn't say it. That's what you say. They take him, they beat him, they whip him, they Put a crown of thorns on him they take him they nail him to a cross you know they stick him up on the ground uh which is a very painful slow agonizing suffocating death and uh they mock him and taunt him and, and, and probably just a handful of people because he wasn't significant in the way that you know we would think he was but you know and on the cross you know he's, he's, he's said that you know 
um, <clears throat> he says these words. He says, you know, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Yeah. And think about that. To the people who hurt him, whether you think he's God or not God, I don't care. This is what you and I can learn to do. And some people say, I would never do that. Other people, but I can tell you, if you do, it will transform you. He goes, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Now, um, in that context, it sounds like those people will benefit from forgiveness. But in our context, in my context, if I forgive somebody who's, who's been um, trying to harm me, I let yeah. me off the hook. I give up being engaged with somebody. The people who are the, the most difficult people in my life, I've learned are the biggest blessings in my life, just like the hardships are. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and people go, I don't want energy vampires. I have to put up my boundaries. I don't, I'm not saying that you can't or don't. You, you make your own decisions. What I'm yes. saying is when I, when I decided that I love them, they're a gift, I'm learning from them because when my buttons are being pushed, instead of focusing on them, focus on why my buttons are pushed and what I can do to resolve that, I get yes. free. I yes. get free. They might still be who they are. They might still do what they do to me, but I, I'm no longer involved with it because it's not about me trying to react to them or resist them it's me yes. being letting them be them and there's this amazing disconnect and this amazing freedom so forgive them forgive yourself forgive your circumstances forgive the events in your life and and be free and then learn how to go with the flow he then said into your hands i commend my spirit you know in other words i give over again to your will it's not my will but your will whether it's your higher power whether it's god whether it's the universe whether it's yourself whatever it is allow yourself to give into that mm. so that you can go with the flow and so that you can kind of be one with everything right um but and then at the end he said it's finished it's complete in other words i have nothing further to do because the work what i am who i am is complete i've forgiven i've surrendered and i am now willing to go forward in whatever way i go forward and then if you believe the story he you know he died and he was resurrected he was transformed and but mm. it was through the suffering that some will say the world is saved, but through the suffering, you could also say that Jesus was transformed, whether he's God or not. And, I, and again, I don't want to step on religious toes, but if you just look at the allegory behind it, or one of the many possible allegories behind it, you can come up with a lot of good stuff and a lot of good lessons that teach us, you are so wonderful inside of you, you mm. and me, and each mm. one listening and watching is infinite possibility and potential. And in order to discover that, we have to get outside of that doing what we always do and thinking how we always think. But when we do and when we get outside of it, we can begin to look back in and go, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. I didn't notice that. And an entire world starts to blossom and open up. So if you if you think of things as a problem, there'll be a problem. If you think of things as a blessing, there'll be a blessing. And that's why I say just celebrate it all. Yeah. Celebrate yeah. everything. Be grateful because appreciation appreciates. And when you do that, life transforms even if the circumstances don't you navigate them better but i tell you i promise you they also will start to change so it's a beautiful beautiful thing learn to live life on your terms i'm so glad that we had this conversation thank you so much your beautiful work that you do and 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 i'm i'm thrilled that that i had this opportunity to be with you i i'm thrilled because you've shared some amazing stuff and thank you so much for sharing that particular story because it's the ultimate story of suffering and transformation. And we, we all know the story, but we don't remember it. And forgiveness is the hardest job for most of us. You know, it is so tough to do. But as you said, if you can truly do it and mean it, you set yourself free, 100%. Yeah. Well, it, and and if if you given what i said about directing your mind if if we and, mm. and i don't disagree with you you know if we say it's the hardest thing to do because certainly it can be but mm. if you go how can i make this easier what yes. do i need to focus on so that i can more readily willingly forgive how can i what can i pay attention to about this person or the circumstance or myself that allows me the freedom to accept and to allow yeah. if if i only go wow this is hard I'm never going to be able to do this. How would I ever do that? I, True. I, I don't get Thank there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah, Rex, we we could literally have a much longer conversation. Well, it, <laughs> I, I really appreciate 
you being around and doing all the amazing stuff that you're doing to help all of us um yeah reduce our conditioned mind reduce our suffering um and improve improve our lives so brilliant thank you so much for your time thank you um, so much for your time and I thanks love for the having you on and um maybe one day if you're ever in the united kingdom doing any speaking gigs do let me know we'll meet up oh yeah absolutely i'd love that take care I, Bye hope, for I, now. Hope that, I hope that happens sooner rather than later so it'll be figuring out how to make that happen quickly yeah definitely we'll set the intention for it that's right thank and you all your viewers and listeners thank you uh, have a beautiful day and beyond and and live the life of your dreams live it on your terms create the life that you want because you can beautiful thank you if you've enjoyed this podcast please rate subscribe and share at will I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.